These players put fear in their opponents' hearts, not because of their skill or the number of points they were scoring, but because of their sheer physical strength and willingness to throw hands at any given moment. This is a list of players that nobody wanted to mess with, the scariest NBA players of all time. There were plenty of NBA players who could fight, but only one was a real MMA fighter, James Johnson, a 6'7", 240-pound power forward who currently plays for the Pacers, was a lead vote-getter in a survey of who in the league would you least like to fight. Since he was five years old, Johnson trained karate and is a black belt. He's also competed in kickboxing with a 20-0 amateur record and a 7-0 MMA record. He even said that he could beat John Jones if he had enough time to train wrestling. I could beat him for real. But like I said, with a year of training defense, I just need ground defense. The whole league would say the same thing. One player said of Johnson, that's not smoke they want. I'm seeing it in person. And it's easy to be a bully when you're one of the biggest and strongest guys in the court. But how about being one of the most terrifying players in the NBA while weighing less than 200 pounds? Vernon Maxwell was listed at 6 foot 4 and 180 pounds, but his nickname Mad Max says everything you need to know. During his career, Maxwell was fighting everybody: guards, centers, opponents, teammates, and even spectators. And while he was in Houston, Max got into a heated argument with teammate Hakeem Olajuwon and nearly stabbed him to death. But Mad Max didn't stop there, because in 2000, when he played for Seattle, Mad Max wanted to beat up another teammate, Gary Payton. Vernon wanted to fight Payton so bad that he ended up hurting two of his teammates who tried to be peacemakers. And this next guy also dabbled in MMA, but he also happens to be the most physically dominant player of all time. During his prime, Shaq weighed between 330 and 370 pounds, and yet he could move like a ballet dancer. His combination of size, strength, and agility was unmatched and nobody could stop the Shaq attack. Not only was Shaq dominant, he was also vicious towards his opponents. I mean, this guy was a, a force. He was mean. He was nasty. The morning after you played with Shaq, it always felt like you were in a fight. You were sore from head to toe, Nazar Muhammad. You're looking at him like, the fear that you might get is he's doing that full speed thing. Am I really going to try and take a charge on right, this? Right. Like, father time guarded Shaq. <laughs> Only player ever to not shoot anything outside of the paint and dominate. <laughs> And when it comes to Shaq's dear frenemy on Inside the NBA, it's safe to say he had a little temper as well. Charles Barkley was an undersized big man, standing at only 6'6", six six, but he was athletic, extremely physical, and wasn't backing down from anybody. Barkley's lists of fights and on-court incidents is extremely long, starting with this forearm knockdown, or that time when he single-handedly fought the bad boy Pistons. Barkley's career was even in jeopardy at one point, because he was not only fighting on the court, but also getting into brawls with civilians. Like that time in 1997, when he got arrested after throwing a man through a glass window at a bar, or in 1991, when Sir Charles infamously spat on a young girl sitting in the crowd while aiming to spit on someone else. When you combine that with all the fighting, cursing, and trash talk, Chuck was one of the baddest to ever lace him up. But how about being one of the craziest? Ron Artest served an 86-game suspension for the most gruesome incident in NBA history, but that was just one of his many incidents on the court. From the moment he arrived in the league in 1999 until he won a championship with Kobe in 2010, Artest was one of the most physical and aggressive defenders that nobody wanted to play against. In 2001, when Jordan was prepping for his second unretirement, Artest broke his ribs in a pickup game. But beyond being a world-class defender and a defensive player of the year, Ron instilled fear in opponents because he was a wild man. Artest drank alcohol before and even during games, and he'd always play on the edge of getting ejected. In 2003, he nearly fought Pat Riley and the whole Miami Heat bench, and that same year, in a game against the Knicks, Ron got so mad that he destroyed some poor cameraman's equipment. You'd think that he'd calm down after serving his suspension for the malice at the palace, but Artest just continued to punch people in the face. In 2007, Artest had to spend 20 days in jail for another off-court incident because he beat up his wife. But despite changing his name to Meta World Peace in 2011, his old habits remained, just as James Harden. A decade before Artest started punching people on NBA courts, one particular bully was more terrifying than anybody. Charles Oakley came into the league in 1985 
and he quickly gained a reputation for being an enforcer. When you needed a hard foul, Oakley was there. When a fight broke out between players, Oak was right in the middle of it. In 1989, he squared up against Xavier McDaniel, another colorful character who could easily be on this list. In the 1996 preseason, Oakley and Barkley got tangled up on a rebound, and Oakley tossed Barkley to the floor. It didn't matter that it was preseason, as both players immediately started swinging and got ejected. During the 1997 playoffs, Oak got into a fight with Alonzo Mourning, and next year, these two hotheads got into it again. In 2000, Oakley punched Clippers guard Jeff McInnes after a dispute over a mutual romantic interest. Oakley didn't even wait for the game to start. He punched McInnes during a pregame shoot-around. But maybe the biggest ass-whooping Oakley ever dealt was that of Tyrone Hill, who Oakley beat up over a gambling debt. Even after he retired from the league, Oak wasn't done fighting, as there were several reports of him beating up people who dared to step up to him. However, Oakley wasn't all brute and no heart, and he's the main reason one other scary guy even made it to the NBA. When he was a high school kid, Ben Wallace attended Charles Oakley's basketball camp, and Oakley being Oakley punched him in the face. He got the ball, drive to the basket, bam. Hold me in the lip, you know, split my jump. Because he showed no fear and played with tenacious energy, Oakley immediately fell in love with Wallace's game, and he recommended him to his alma mater, Virginia Union University. Without Oakley, Big Ben might have never played in the NBA. But once he made the league, he showed immediately that he was made of the same material as his mentor. At 6'9", Wallace was the shortest center in the league, but they called him Big Ben for a reason. See, Ben was a fitness freak who never left the gym and could bench 400 pounds. Due to his muscular body, mean face, and crazy afro. Nobody was messing with him, and it didn't end well for the ones who tried. Honorable mention goes to his teammate Rashid Wallace, a guy who couldn't control his anger and who played like a ticking time bomb. Rashid was a walking technical foul, and he's the all-time leader in techs in a season with 41. But two Wallaces are not the baddest Detroit big men of all time. That title belongs to Bill Lambeer and Rick Mahorn, who put the bad in the bad boy Pistons. There wasn't an NBA player in the 80s who wasn't punched, elbowed, or shown to the floor by Detroit's big men, and they long had a reputation for being the dirtiest players ever, especially Lambeer. While Mahorn was setting hard screens and throwing punches, I mean, I love to play defense. I like to bump and bang, I guess, and that's what's basically has been my job. Lambeer was also notorious for planting his feet in the player's landing space, which resulted in plenty of ankle injuries. I didn't really ever like Lambeer in any social situation. No. Yeah. And uh, it's because he's a dirty player. And the final part of the Bad Boys front court trio played the hardest of them all. Dennis Rodman was called The Worm, but his other nickname, Dennis the Menace, probably suits him even better. Playing with unlimited energy, Rodman would get in opponents' faces. He'd trip them, annoy them, and not let them breathe. What I'm seeing, the battle between these two guys. They're fighting, giving it everything they got. Dennis wasn't the scariest player ever, but he was certainly one of the most irritating and physically difficult to play against. Nobody had an easy night against Rodman. And this next player was far from the biggest or the strongest, yet nobody wanted to mess with him, not even Shaq. Standing at 6'6 and 220 pounds, he may not look like a bruiser, but Jerry Stackhouse was a bad man and somebody you didn't want to get angry. Stackhouse's fists have a long list of NBA faces on their resume. In 1996, he landed a couple of big haymakers on Jeff Hornacek during a game. In 97, Stack punched Allen Iverson in the face in practice, who was one of his best friends on the Sixers. However, if you think that Stack only went after little guys, think twice. In 99, Stackhouse beat the hell out of 6'10 Christian Leitner over a gambling debt. But the coup de grace of his fighting career happened in 2005, when he brutally beat down jazz rookie Kirk Snyder. After the game in which Snyder provoked Stackhouse, Jerry asked his equipment manager for a tracksuit so he wouldn't mess up his suit. He then walked to the jazz bus and put a smackdown on Snyder. We, we were in the game, he gave, gave me a cheap shot, and I just kind of lost it. I wasn't worried about the game anymore, so I just waited for him in the tunnel. After which, arena security testified that Snyder received a severe beating. Treating it like any other day at the office, Stackhouse returned to the locker room, calmly handed over the tracksuit to the equipment manager, and put on his suit and tie like nothing happened. In the 2006 finals, after he fouled Shaq super hard, nobody from the Heat said a thing to Jerry, and even Shaq just walked away. And the last, but not least, scary person on this list will always be remembered for his violence, 
and not for his four all-star appearances. It's Latrell Sprewell, whose career lowlight is the 1997 choking of P.J. Carlissimo, his coach on the Golden State Warriors. Carlissimo yelled at Sprewell to try a little harder in practice and wanted him to put a little mustard on his passes. Spree was in a bad mood that day, and something triggered him to attack his coach. Latrell threatened to kill his coach and started dragging him backward by the throat like a rag doll, proceeding to choke out Carlissimo for a good 10 seconds before he got pulled away by his teammates. After he spent 10 minutes in the locker room, Spree still wasn't satisfied and came back to attack his coach again. Because of apparent marks on Calissimo's neck, the NBA issued an investigation and suspended Spreewell for 68 games without pay. But this wasn't the only beating of Spree's career. In 1995, he beat up teammate Jerome Kersey and then returned to practice with a 2x4, threatening to kill Kersey. Then, to top it off, in 2002, he came to the Knicks practice camp with a broken hand, which he broke after an assault on his yacht. And before we finish this off, here's a couple of honorable mentions of the scariest guys ever. There's Carl Malone, the all-time leader in technical fouls, and the unofficial all-time leader in elbows thrown. Then there's Kenyon Martin, who made a career out of being tougher and meaner than his opponents. Kevin Garnett made most rookies' lives a living hell. Ivan Johnson was called Ivan the Terrible and made people uncomfortable just by his presence. And the two hosts of the All Smoke podcast were no strangers to a fist fight. Javaris Crittenden, Anthony Mason, David West, Quinn Quincy AC and Udonis Haslam all deserve a mention as well. If you think we forgot somebody, please let us know in the comments, and check out some of our other videos on the screen now.